Uh, Romans chapter 3. Let's open with prayer. Father, we do pray for the Nugents as they return, not having healed completely, and uh, uh, give them a safe trip home tonight. Father, we pray that as we open the scriptures together, the Holy Spirit will make your word clear to each person in this gathering and to the ones who listen by recording. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right. We were in Romans chapter 3, and uh, I just noted the fact that while in Romans 3, 11, none is, not, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, man is not inclined to seek after God, but God does seek after man, but God draws man. He does not force himself upon man or coerce man. He allows human beings to express their free will. In John twelve thirty two, if I be lifted up, I will draw all to myself. I will draw, and that's what that means, draw or pull all to myself, but won't force them to, into making a decision. Yeah, uh, just flip over to Romans chapter 5. If you need to even flip a page, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Spiritual death is... Uh, the status that the man and the woman were in right after they ate of the fruit. One of the results, which is physical death, but also which is sickness, mental illness, uh, sin, affiliation with evil. There are many results of spiritual death, uh, one of which is physical death, but the whole package came uh, into the world through one man and death through sin, so that death that is spiritual death spread to all men because all sin. Uh, back up in verse 6, Romans 5, verse 6, for while we were still weak or helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly or the godless. Verse 8, But God shows his love for us, or is in the, the New American Standard Version, demonstrates his love, present tense, because why, why is it present tense? Because he's already gone to the cross and... Uh, died on the cross and rose from the dead. So how is he still showing us his love for us? He's demonstrating or showing his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us by showing us those facts. That's how he's demonstrating his love. God is demonstrating his love through this very epistle and through uh, the other books in the Bible as well. But he's demonstrating his love. Romans in particular is a demonstration of God's love through the uh, exposition of what Christ accomplished on the cross and Calvary, the cross on Calvary. Now, this is, is spiritual death and 
Those in spiritual death are called, but they are not forced to believe. And total depravity is obliterated by the fact that, yes, human beings are in spiritual death. They are uh, unable to help themselves, but God has reached out and made it possible for those in spiritual death to believe through the pre-salvation work of the Holy Spirit. And so believers are called to believe. John 3.16, John 5.24, Acts 16.31, uh, Romans 4.5, and uh, on it goes, uh, John three, seventeen. On it goes, uh, John in John chapter six. What we what might we do that we might work the works of God? Believe on Him who He has sent. The Calvinistic concept of total depravity is depraved. And then unconditional election. And we these we explored last week, so I'm reviewing them quickly. But unconditional election. No, election is conditional. Now, God has chosen the elect in eternity before he created time, but there is a condition to be one of the elect. What is that condition? to believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his unique son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but would have eternal life. And uh, so limited atonement, the Calvinistic concept that Christ died only for the elect, blown out of the water by First John 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation, that is the satisfaction of the righteousness and justice of God. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, of the Calvinist unable to process that or unable to, to refute that, says, well, the world, that means the world of the elect. It's all they can come up with. There's no scriptural basis, no context of any verse in the Bible that puts the world uh, into the situation of being the elect. But they have to come out, up with something to defend their system. So they say, well, he died for the world of the elect. Well, why would John say, under the inspiration of the, the Holy Spirit, that he died for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world? Well, limited atonement is refuted by Second Corinthians 5, verse 14. The love of Christ controls us, having concluded that one died for all. Therefore, and this is still part of the, the, the conclusion, the recognition, one died for all, therefore all died. That is, they died in Adam, just like in Romans 5.12. They died in Adam, all sin in Adam, all died in Adam. First Corinthians 2, verse 4, God desires, God our Savior desires all men. The Greek is pantas anthropus, all human beings. God desires that all human beings would be saved. 
and would come to the knowledge of the truth. Let's look at that verse. First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. That blows away limited atonement, along with Hebrews two nine. Uh, he tasted death for everyone. But first Timothy two. First Timothy two and verse four. First Timothy two and verse uh let's take it from verse three. First Timothy two verse three. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is actually very well translated in this version. Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, how does this not mean universal reconciliation, which is very serious error, because of the many, 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 many passages in the Bible that place belief on the Lord Jesus Christ as a condition for salvation. So while God desires all people to be saved, he has simply factored into his sovereign plan free will in human beings. He has factored in the fact that human beings are allowed to exercise their free will to make choices and to choose to believe or not to believe. Calvinists believe that is an affront to God's sovereignty, that no way could man's will be involved at all. That's, that is an attack on God's sovereignty. I say, and the Bible says, that because God is sovereign— which means he completely controls every aspect of, of the universe, included his created beings. A sovereign God, who is also omnipotent, has perfect, all-inclusive power, eternal power. God is able to factor in his plan, created beings who have free will and he allows them to make decisions freely, to make choices freely, including to choose whether to believe on his son Jesus Christ or to choose not to. And unbelievers are all in a tizzy about that because they say, you mean God can, uh, God created people with a capacity to choose to go into the lake of fire. Well, the answer to that is yes, he did. But these same people who think that how could a loving God do that? These same people, if you would suggest taking away any of their capacity of choice for any of the things they like to do in life, they would think that you are the cruelest person in the world. Irresistible grace, the, the fourth 
point of five-point Calvinism, blown away by the same verse that blows away the doctrine of unlimited atonement. You'll find some of these verses, some of these verses blow away uh, several points of Calvinism because, again, it's true. If you if you destroy one point, you've destroyed the whole system. If you've destroyed the, the system, you've destroyed the premise of the system, predestination, as the Calvinist sees it. If you destroy uh, the, the notion of predestination as the Calvinist sees it, then you've destroyed the five-point system. You, you destroy any, any of the five points, you've destroyed the whole system. Well, irresistible grace in the mind of the Calvinist is that saving grace overcomes the resistance of those God has determined to save so that they cannot choose not to be saved. Well, that is refuted by... uh, the fact that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's also refuted by uh, Matthew chapter 23. You can turn there with me, a verse in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus speaking, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. If that's not enough, Acts 7.51. I think we looked at that last week. Stephen when he was being stoned to death. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are uncircumcised. You are just as your fathers were. You resist the Holy Spirit. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two. And in Second uh, Timothy chapter two, let's look at We're going to start at verse 11. The saying is trustworthy for, and that's actually a translation of of pistos ha lagos, faithful is the word or the information. Uh, That's, it's translated in the King James Version as faithful is the word. And the Apostle Paul uses that phrase several times, and it is it is believed by many that uh, that's part of a, a hymn, perhaps a hymn he wrote, or he just maybe wrote in uh, a certain meter at times uh, as he wrote, uh, because we have a that. Uh, Pistos Halagos is in several other places, but we also have in this section a portion that that has meter. It, it has the character of 
poetry, the way each line begins and uh, the the uh, the contrast within each line and the the uh, rhythm of it. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. These are all first class conditions, by the way, saying that we do all of these, these things. If we deny him, which we do, it doesn't mean we do all the time, but if we do, or you could say when we do, he also will deny us. That doesn't mean deny us of our salvation, which is the first place the legalist wants to go. The legalist believes God is always out to get me. And and I'll take any verse. They don't consciously think this way, but they do this. They take any verse that they that possibly could be twisted to be bad news and and make God out to be some kind of a monster who's always out to get you, then they say, well, he will deny us. That means uh, deny us eternal life, deny us going to heaven. No, he will deny us. The word actually means he'll contradict us. Where will he contradict us? At the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Where will he also contradict us? In in human life, uh, our, while we're still physically alive, through uh, divine discipline, uh, he'll contradict us. But uh, we don't lose our salvation. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So this gets rid this completely debunks the final point of five point calvinism the p of tulip perseverance of the saints the doctrine that teaches that if we persevere then we ultimately will uh, be counted as one of the elect. In other words, it, it, let me put it a different way. All of the elect will persevere with lives that are substantially obedient to Christ and substantially bear spiritual fruit. And the, the Calvinists will concede that we don't do this all of the time, but the Calvinist says that you determine whether you are saved by looking at whether you are bearing spiritual fruit. This is the actual proof of whether you're saved. And uh, the fact is that there are those who are saved and they do not go on to persevere with consistent obedient, obedience to Christ and they do not fulfill the spiritual life, and they do not consistently bear spiritual fruit. The Calvinists would say people who don't do that, people who don't ultimately come through, haven't genuine, genuinely believed. They aren't genuinely say they aren't, uh, actually, the elect. And I'm going to read from one of them uh, that uh, I included in my book on the first part of Acts. Uh, but this, this, this really gives insight into how these people think. 
And this was an article, it was a short article that uh, Dr. R.C. Spruill wrote. He's a, a, a well-known defender of Calvinism. And uh, he's uh, located in Ligonier, Pennsylvania. That's the at least uh, he used to be. That, that was the central place of their ministry. I don't know if they've moved or not, but they did a publication called Table Talk. And since I wanted to include the whole article, which is only four paragraphs, but I actually... Uh, as I was writing the book of Acts, I actually sent to them for written permission to uh, include this in my book of Acts, saying that I wanted to, to do a review of it. And they wrote me back, and I have permission on file uh, that they gave me. I didn't, I didn't say why I wanted to include it, but I did uh, say that uh, I wanted to include a, a review. A review of this article would would you be so kind as to give me permission to do that and they said yes so dr spruill in table talk wrote of a chilling personal experience that he had undergone in my in my book i have the the heading of this over this article, Dr. Spruill's terrifying experience. So listen up and, and listen closely. There are, this is now I'm beginning to quote him. There are people in this world who are not saved, but who are convinced that they are. The presence of such people causes genuine Christians to doubt their salvation. After all, we wonder, suppose I am in this category. Suppose I am mistaken about my salvation and am really going to hell. How can I know that I am a real Christian? A while back, I had one of those moments of acute self-awareness that we have from time to time. And suddenly the question hit me. R.C., what if you are not one of the redeemed? What if your destiny is not heaven after all, but hell? Let me tell you, I was flooded in my body with a chill that went from my head to the bottom of my spine. I was terrified. I tried to grab hold of myself. I thought, well, it's a good sign that I'm worried about this. Only true Christians really care about salvation. But then I began to take stock of my life, and I looked at my performance. My sins came pouring into my mind. And the more I looked at myself, the worse I felt. I thought, maybe it's really true. Maybe I'm not saved after all. I went into my room and began to read the Bible. On my knees, I said, well, here I am. I can't point to my obedience. There's nothing I can offer. I can rely only on your atonement for my sins. I'll just interject here. Calvin or R.C. Sproul was thinking of his sins as his sins along with the sins of the other elect. How do I know that? Because he's a Calvinist, and that's what Calvinists believe, and he is a staunch Calvinist. Okay, back to his writing. I'll repeat the last sentence I read from him. There's nothing, uh, the last two sentences. There's nothing that I can offer. 
I can rely only on your atonement for my sins. I can only throw myself on your mercy. Even then I knew that some people who only flee to the cross to escape hell, not out of a real turning to God. I could not be sure about my own heart and motivation. Then I remembered John six sixty eight. Jesus had been giving out hard teaching, and many of his former followers had left him. When he asked Peter if he was also going to leave, Peter said, where else can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. In other words, Peter was also uncomfortable, but he realized that being uncomfortable with Jesus was better than any other option. So, in my opinion, R.C. pulled this off rather smoothly because, because in the end, he kind of makes himself appear humble as relying on the Lord, and yet at the same time, he professes that God would have us in an uncomfortable place from time to time, like he was very uncomfortable. In fact, it was a chilling experience for him. He was terrified. But that's a healthy thing in the mind of this Calvinist, because it's this kind of experience that can prove that it's this kind of experience by which you can prove to yourself that you are really one of the elect. Because if you weren't one of the elect, you really wouldn't care about this situation. So my question is, my rhetorical question to you and to myself is, is this how God wants us to live? Does God want us to always have this fear in the back of our minds that we may not be genuine, genuinely his elect, that we may not have been genuinely saved? Or does God want us to simply take him at his word that those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in John 5.24 have passed out from the judgment of spiritual death into the possession of eternal life. I believe with all my heart the latter. And if you drink the Calvinistic Kool-Aid, you can't help but having the same kind of experiences in your life many times, if you live long enough, the same kind, many, many times you'll have the same kind of experience that Dr. R.C. describes in this article. And with that, let's close in prayer for tonight's second session. Father, thank you for the assurance of salvation that we have in your word. We thank you for revealing the gospel message to us and calling our attention to our accountability to believe on your Son. And we thank you for the fact that without any merit whatsoever on our part, throughout anything we've worked for or earned or deserved in your plan, 
you've saved us. And we thank you that we are your elect. And we know it not from looking at our personal lives, but from the word, the information, the testimony of the scriptures. We thank you, Father, that you give us the assurance of salvation through your word, and we do not have to have chilling or terrifying experiences, wondering if we are genuine children of God. And we thank you that you have seen fit to show us the importance of defending that good news, the gospel of grace. How we're saved, what we're saved unto, and the fact that once we are saved, we are always saved. And we pray with thanksgiving in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.